Live from our nation's capital, by way of Orange County, it's the Larry O'Connor Show. And you can get it right Right. now. That's right, right now. I am in the nation's capital, but I'm just for you right now, Southern California. It's just you and me talking. I do love our show intro. It makes me smile every time I hear it. Live from the nation's capital by way of Orange County, because, yes, I lived most of my life in Orange County. I miss my beloved Orange County, the most beautiful place in the state, if not the country, if not the world. And Orange County has sort of been the epicenter of, uh, well, what I like to call the surfer rebellion. Huntington Beach and Dana Point and Newport Beach and so many patriots in Orange County rising up and saying, what the hell are we doing here? We did what we were told to do. Let us go now. Let us go. Let's get back to work. And, well, one of the voices of reason coming out of Orange County, who has to make a schlep up to Sacramento now and again to beat his head against the wall, is none other than State Senator John Morlock. And he joins us now. Senator Morlock, thanks for being here. Tell Orange County I said hi, please. I miss it. Uh, Please visit. And if you ever need a place to stay, uh, the wife and I have a guest room for you. Oh, that's good to know. But see, that'll become a scandal of some kind, I'm sure. But but I will take you up on that, Senator. Uh, listen, I love your column at California Globe, when a curve is not necessarily a curve. And I want to get into this uh, and many things that you address. First, let's let's hit that issue on a curve, because we were told that we need to go through this extraordinary paralysis of our economy and our way of life, frankly, to flatten the curve. The idea was to sort of spread the pain out a little bit on this virus. You can't stop a virus. It's going to spread. But instead of making it spike and overburden our hospitals in California, we're going to go through these uh, measures to flatten it. Have we succeeded in that goal? Well, <clears throat> I think what, what we've seen, perhaps, Larry, is that we expected something much more dramatic than what we actually encountered, at least Mm -hmm. in Orange County, if you look at our numbers. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were told by the governor a month and a half ago that uh, we could expect half of the residents of California to contract COVID-19. I mean, that's a model that is like on steroids, right? Uh, And so we keep looking for a model that was telling us to get ready for a surge, get ready for a spike. I mean, we have the Mercy ship here. We've been uh, told, told hospitals not to take any patients other than covid so I've got hospitals going broke because there aren't patients here in Orange County. And, and I've, I've got doctors and dentists who are told not to practice, and they're having a difficult time trying to figure out what do they do with their staff and how do they pay for that. And everyone's getting their bank accounts cleared out because everybody made assumptions with who knows what algorithms that there was going to be this massive impact on California. Now, I don't know if it was because we did the sheltering in place in such a you know strong lockdown fashion or if maybe the whole uh, pandemic was oversold. It, either way, uh, it looks like the dangers, and they were grave dangers, you're right, Senator Morlock, that we were warned of, it seems like it, those are not going to occur from one reason or another. So has, has Governor Newsom now sort of moved the goalposts where it's no longer about just flattening the curve and not worrying about overburdening our hospitals, but it's to in some way eradicate the virus or make sure that every Californian is safe from the virus? Because that's a tall order. Yeah, and I'm not an epi- epidemiologist. Um, but you Heck, know, you we're, can't we're, even we're, say it. I know. Um, I, 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 I'm not pre-med. Sorry, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're all learning about herd immunity and, you know, talks about, you know, social distancing and, and, and talk about uh, potentially having a, a, a vaccine, yada, yada. Uh, <laughs> but we, 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 we're doing it at such an economic cost that it is overwhelming that more than 30 million people have filed for unemployment benefits around the nation that more than 3.7 million people in california have filed for uh, unemployment benefits we are already as a state asking the federal government to loan us money to pay unemployment benefits we didn't do we did that in the in the great recession and in just about a year or two ago we finally paid off yeah. that bill but it was done not by the state's tax revenues that you know Gavin Newsom brags about it was done by charging every employer a higher rate for their federal unemployment tax at the end of the year 
And uh, that was a nasty way to have to pay it off to, yeah. to hammer businesses. And, and now those businesses are closing their doors. Right. Uh, it, it, this is tragic beyond any realm of, of, of anything we would have ever expected. Well, and Senator Morlock, I mean, I, I just to, you know, sort of uh, uh, put a different perspective on it, it was paid for, by that tax increase, but it only got paid because the California economy finally started charging back up at the pace of the rest of the country, because people were getting employed, because businesses were starting to thrive, finally. Uh, and you're right, now they're devastated. And so my worry here, and I know it's your worry because you express it in this great column at CaliforniaGlobe.com, is that uh, once we start to slowly get back to work, all your colleagues in Sacramento are going to say, well, we've got to pay these bills, so let's raise everybody's taxes. Yeah, isn't that the normal? Yes. <laughs> That's it's, know, a, it's a well-founded I, fear, John. <laughs> you know, it's just unbelievable, and it'll be temporary, right? Oh, yes. Like, like Proposition 30 was temporary, only to be followed by Proposition 55 that made it literally permanent. Um, and and it, it, it is scary. You're, you really need to start looking, Sacramento, at reducing tax rates so we increase the volume of, of business and, and the economy, which then, therefore, increases tax revenues. And if you want to uh, tighten the economy, just raise taxes some more. That's why, you know, the Federal Reserve Board raises interest rates to slow the economy down. So the same is true for raising taxes. So let's hope let's hope my colleagues figure that one out and quick. But, you know, they haven't figured out a lot of stuff. I mean, why is Orange County's beaches, why are they told to shut down when L.A. County's beaches were shut down and you have a much higher COVID rate per capita, I mean, a very higher rate in Los Angeles than we did in Orange County. And so those residents come down and visit us because our beaches are open, and then the governor punishes us. Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, if the governor can't figure things like this out, uh, how is he going to, you know, restore this economy and, 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 and this state moving forward? I, I, it makes me very nervous. If I have a governor that doesn't trust us, how do we trust him? Well, it's a great question, and uh, and sadly, I think the answer is we can't. We can't, especially because I want to go back to something you said. That the governor made all of these decisions based on God knows what models. Well, we have a right to know what models, right? I mean, usually when we have major decisions that affect every Californian, Senator Marlock, it's done through committee, it's done through debate, there is a record, there is transparency. We know who is in the room debating these things in the state Senate or in the Assembly. All of these decisions have come from the executive branch. Gavin Newsom's got his own private advisors. We don't know who they are. I didn't vote for them. You didn't uh, 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 go through the confirmation process of them. Don't we have it, uh, since he's led by science, as he keeps telling us, don't we have a right to see the science he's looking at so we know exactly how he's making these decisions? And now we're finding out that he's spending a whole boatload of money every month for a PR firm. Yeah. So is it being done by science or is it being done by wet your finger, lift it up into the sky and see which way the wind is blowing? Right. And and, uh, and it, what's going to play well on Wolf Blitzer? Exactly. Exactly. And then and then to have a uh, an opportunity to be on a national network and then announce that you've purchased a half a billion dollars worth of face masks. You know, I I, I was able to from, find from China by the way, oh. from, a, from a Chinese firm that has a dodgy record when it comes to safety and, and products as well, as reported by the L.A. Times, sir. Yes, thank you very much, Larry. <laughs> I, I, I knew that. I just didn't want to make that point quite yet. But you're, Sorry. You're ahead of I'm, me. That's fine. I'm getting ahead but, of you. But, 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 you know, we, 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 we had someone do a public records request from the state controller and said, give us the, the copies of the check. And it wasn't. It was five checks at ninety nine million dollars a piece. So obviously, uh, it was four hundred ninety five million dollars going to China, and and they had to do it in five checks because maybe if you do it under a hundred million, you don't need two signatures or who knows what. Wow. So the gamesmanship and the lack of transparency. And here we are. How how many weeks later? Still no contract, and even more awkwardly, still no face masks. Yeah. So BYD may stand for bilk your deposit. But do we have to pay such a high price to deal with a coronavirus that didn't come on in gangbusters like everyone anticipated? And, and you had models that had the wrong algorithms. You expected some kind of exponential growth that did not occur. And so let's get back to work. Open this economy. Tell people to use the right protocols. But trust your constituents, Governor Newsom. 
Yeah, well said. And I'm sorry for getting ahead of that story, but I get riled up about this stuff. You know that, Senator Morlock. You've known that about me for decades now. Uh, yeah, but China, get... China, you know, bring it up, Larry, because that is, is that not the most ironic place to have to buy face masks from right. and to give them the money first? Yeah. Cash I mean, up front, and, and it sounds like it was in small, unmarked bills, $99 million at a time. It, could, could we not at the very least put a, a mandate on money that's spent during this pandemic that it has to be spent here in California uh, to help a California business instead of, for God's sake, forget about a Nevada business, a Chinese business? Well, now you're being logical. Now knock it off. Yeah, I know. Well, it's, that's why I'm not going to hold elected office. We're speaking with Senator John <laughs> Morlock of Orange County. His column must be read when a curve is not necessarily curve. And by the way, I want to I want to come to one of the points you make here. Residents of the Golden State have become slaves to a new debt, to a lockdown, and to a previously ignored unfunded actuarial accrued liabilities. They must be freed from these chains. Let's talk about that second part, unfunded actuarial accrued liabilities. Of course, you're talking about the pension funds. It's, it's a bill that's waiting to get paid that has been negotiated with uh, government employee unions by Democrats. And this is a big bill that's coming up, isn't it? It's massive. And so is the unfunded liabilities for retiree medical also massive. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, not just and pension. You're right. And and so uh, that would be the reason for your opening comment, and that is raising taxes. Yeah. And I, 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 I will find it very difficult for the taxpayers of this state when they realize that they're the biggest creditor of cities and counties and California are their employees, and they will never see lifetime uh, benefits for medical. They will never see a defined benefit pension plan paying income for life. Uh, but they're going to then make contributions in higher taxes to the state and local governments to pay for employees to, to, to receive that. That won't work. That, that, that is uh, fodder for, you know, it's like gunpowder. It's just going to be a mess. And so we've got to look at things a little differently. One, you can't change pensions and retiree medical uh, benefits it, with legislation. The Democrats control Sacramento. They would never touch a bill like that. Uh, I can give you an example of one Democrat that did do a bill, and, and he can't even get an endorsement from his own party, yeah. and he's an incumbent. Two, if you want to do it through a ballot measure here in California, very difficult. You have an attorney general that's going to give some ballot title to it that doesn't make sense. We saw that just uh, two years ago with uh, Proposition 6. So three, you've got to actually put these cities and counties into a federal bankruptcy court for, and file Chapter 9, and then you need to have a whole new different pension plan and a whole new different uh, medical uh, retiree medical plan. Say for retiree medical, Stockton, they had a half a billion dollar liability when they went into Chapter 9 a few years ago, and they completely, almost completely eliminated the plan, and they wiped off a half a billion dollars from their balance sheet. So those kinds of things are on the future if we do this right, if we take advantage of cleaning up the silliness, the overpromises, uh, the, the, the greed by the public employee unions, and, and get something that's more consistent and comparable to what's happening in the private sector. Chapter 9 for counties and municipalities to uh, help uh, restructure all that. It sounds like you have some experience with that, Senator Morlock. I, did, I, I know there was a guy with a similar name of yours in Orange County as the uh, tax collector and treasurer years and years ago. You wouldn't know him, would you? You know, I have a, a, a calling to, to predict uh, bankruptcies, Larry. Yes, you it's do. just, just yes. part of the DNA. <laughs> but this time I'm doing it to say, okay, look, you look at all the states, and, and, and the Pew, Pew always puts out a, uh, a, a report on how all 50 states are doing with their funding of their pension plans. And Wisconsin is always number one, and they're always like 100% funded, where California is like, you know, down in the 40s, and they're like 67 71% funded. And, and so you dig into it, and you realize that Wisconsin doesn't have a full-blown, abused, defined benefit pension plan. They have a shared risk pension plan, which says, hey, we're not going to assume you're going to earn 8 or 7% a year, every year in perpetuity. You know, you're, you're more likely to make 3 or 4%, which is maybe the best you're ever going to get out of the bond market right now. And we're going to have you retire at normal ages, like in the private sector, not such young ages that are, are currently available in, in public right. plans. 
And we're going to say, wait a second, you're going to have to start contributing a little more yourselves as employees should the returns not be adequate. And um, by the way, no cost of living adjustments for retirees unless the plan outperforms the projections. And then maybe we can give you something for cost of living. So it's like it's like manageable. It isn't like something that is this massive debt that we'll never be able to pay off. And, and so at least there's a solution that should be looked at. And by the way, every one of us hearing you lay that out there, we are all, unless we work for the state, unless we work for the government, we are all in pension plans exactly like the ones you've described. These, these, these defined benefit pension plans went the way of the, of the, you know, Ford Pinto in the late seventies, because even the UAW couldn't afford it, Senator Borlaug. Uh, and that's, and so I guess the solution is we got to get Scott Walker to relocate to California and run for governor <laughs> of California. I, I know the, I know the governor. I'll talk to him about that. He might Scott's do it. Scott's a good man. He's a he good is. man. Especially if yeah. he's been spending a lot of time in Santa Barbara lately with the uh, Young America's Foundation. You never know. Oh, great. Great. Uh, one last uh, uh, question on this point in particular, because it does come back to COVID-19. As we look at the governor's actions, that seems to be stringing this out and making it uh, the pain last much longer than and it appears it should. Could it be, sir, that that he is stretching this out to such an extent where he will then turn to the federal government and say, we're in a disaster here. We need federal bailout money to solve our problems. And he'll use that money to pay off this unfunded actuarial liability. Uh, in other words, instead of California taxpayers paying for it, it'll be taxpayers from Oklahoma, Maine, and really money that isn't even being raised. It's just going to be money that's printed by the federal government. I think that's a fair prediction to make. And then I think that's why Senator Mitch McConnell made a comment about it, saying, wait a second, we're not here to bail out uh, mismanaged states. And, and California is 42nd out of 50 states in, in having the worst balance sheet. And it also has the second highest unrestricted net deficit. We just got bumped out of last place for the first time by New Jersey last year. <laughs> so we have lousy balance sheets for New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, 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 Kentucky. Uh, I mean, I can give you the whole list of, of, of states that are, are mismanaged on top would be like Illinois, which is so mismanaged so that it would be insulting for a lot of us to give money to Illinois. Uh, right. to get their pensions up to snuff, uh, that that would be what we would call a massive transfer of wealth from the private sector to the public sector. And and what needs to be done is is if Gavin Newsom goes to Donald Trump and says, I need money, then Donald Trump said, yeah, you'll get money, but you fix these systemic problems first. Mm. You fix the pensions. You fix the retiree medical and and when every one of the 50 states have done that, then let's talk about what we can do to, to help bail you out. Yeah. Should, should the good, hardworking families of Costa Mesa, should their tax dollars go to bail out the bad decisions of the governor of Illinois? The answer is, of course not. So we have no right to demand it from the other 49 states. Senator Morlock, we got to leave it there, but it's always enlightening to talk with you. Well, uh, you know, if if only... Senator Morlock, somebody who actually can read a balance sheet were to become governor. You know, someone like you, John. Oh, what state, Larry? John Morlock, thanks for joining us, sir. It's always <laughs> good to talk with you. I look forward to seeing you in the o right, in the OC, as people not from Orange County like to refer to it. Thanks, John. It's Thank the you, Larry O'Connor Show on KBC. Uh, Mike Rowe, don't you? Mike Rowe, former host of that show, Dirty Jobs. If you uh, never saw it, you should stream it now. Great thing to binge while you're forced to stay home and not go out to restaurants or the movies. Uh, Mike Rowe is great. He does some great stuff now on social media through his Facebook presence, etc., etc. And uh, he also was struck by uh, what we talked about early in the program here, Governor Cuomo's uh, outrageous challenge to anyone who suggests that maybe through safe protocols and through the knowledge that we've now learned about the virus two months later, that maybe we can start opening up parts of our economy again, you know, so we can pay for all the things we've been spending at the government level. Someone's going to pay for all of this. They're spending a lot of money right now. You've got to pay for it. The only way you pay for it is to get back to work. You're not sitting on a pile of money like Andrew Cuomo. Anyway, Mike Rowe was also taken by that. And uh, and he was in an interview talking about it. And then he also pivoted back to something else. I want you to hear it because Mike Rowe's great. Love having him on the program. Uh, and, and he really nails it here. Well, not to pile up on the governor, you know, but a couple weeks ago, he said another thing that really snapped my neck. 
He said, he said, no measure, no matter how drastic or draconian, should be deemed unjustified if it saves a single life. And the, for the life of me, I mean, look, safety obviously is very, very, very important. But the notion that nothing in the country is more important than staying safe, that's not something commonsensical people embrace. That's something you hear from people who are trying to sell you something or politicians who are trying to get reelected. So we've just we have to get away from the cookie cutter bromides and platitudes yes. and start dealing with one zip code at a time. Thank you. Uh, that's Mike Rowe, and he's uh, showing on Dana Perino's Fox News program. And it's so important. Listen. If anything comes of this, I hope that the Republican Party and people who are speaking for the Republican Party and those Republican governors, for the most part, uh, there are exceptions, of course, but I hope that we are coming across as the common sense party, as the people who recognize what life is really like and what life is really about. And yes, we care. And yes, we're concerned. And yes, we'll make common sense choices to protect people. But ultimately... It's impossible to protect everyone, nor do we want the government to put in measures that does protect everyone. I'll say it again. The government's job is to not protect you. The government's job is not to keep you alive and to save your life. The government's job is to protect your rights. That's why we set up the Constitution in the first place. Look at the Constitution. Read it. Other than protecting our borders, which, of course, the Democrats don't care about, and having strong national defense, the rest of our government's role is to protect our individual rights. That's what made us so different back then. That's what makes us so different right now. If we can keep that. If we can keep that. It's the Larry O'Connor Show on KBC. Ah, it's not Friday. I am in love, though. Larry O'Connor here, AM 790 KABC. You can't throw the cure at me. And then not want me to sing along? Randy. All right, bring it. Fine, fine. It's Friday. I'm in love. But it's not Friday. It's Wednesday. It's hump day. And we're getting you through this thing, keeping you connected, informed, educated, activated. Right here on AM 790K ABC. I'm talking to you, Orange County, standing up against Sacramento. I'm so proud of you. And it looks as though there may be some accommodations being reached here with the governor. Although I don't know if my friends in Huntington Beach and Newport Beach uh, might go along with this. We'll get into that coming up in a moment. But as we talk about COVID-19, as we talk about our government's response at a local, state, and federal level, we cannot lose sight of the original sin here where it all began. And that's why we've spent so much time on this program talking about the Communist Party of China and their role in this. And to bring us up to speed on the latest, it's Brigadier General Robert Spaulding, retired Air Force General, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and his book, Stealth War, How China Took Over While America's Elite Slept, is a pretty important read right now. Uh, General, thanks for joining us, sir. Thank you. Great to be here. So we've got a report now presented to, by Chinese intelligence to top leaders in Beijing a month ago warning about the fallout from the handling of this coronavirus pandemic, which we know originated in China. Uh, we know that this report was so bad that China needed to be prepared for an armed confrontation with the United States. That's Chinese intelligence saying, you guys have messed up the world so much, you need to prepare for a military reaction. What do you make of that? Well, you know, I think uh, it's it's hyperbole in a sense. And, um, you know, they, uh, you know, the Chinese Communist Party has always been hyper concerned about the United States um, military capability and the potential for conflict and and certainly has never felt comfortable in, in, in conflict, direct armed conflict with the United States. Um, so I think it's it, in some ways it doesn't reflect um any anything resembling reality today uh considering most of the things that the chinese communist party does uh to the united states are really in the areas of economics and finance and trade and information 
And based on my previous conversations with you, General, it sounds as though from the U.S. perspective or from the Western world's perspective, hopefully we're not in this alone, uh, any kind of military showdown with China is unnecessary if we use the same tactics, those economic tactics and other tactics that they've used on us. We should be able to use them on there and bring them to their knees, right? I mean, we can actually shift this and have the upper hand with them. We should. Well, I mean, that's exactly uh, correct, and that's because, you know, we ha- we still have a free society. You know, we, we do uh, practice free trade. Uh, China does not practice free trade. You know, in a lot of ways, they're a repressive society. They coerce their citizens. You, you, that's not even really accurate to call them citizens. It's more uh, accurate to call them subjects. And so, um, you know, I think we have a competitive advantage uh, versus the Chinese Communist Party, if we just uh, prevent them from having access, direct access to innovation, talent, uh, um, finance, and um, and um, and technology here in the United States. So, what should we be doing right now? It was reported last week that President Trump uh, had his advisors bouncing around various ideas for uh, the word that was used was retaliation against the Communist Party in China. And I just want to be clear as we talk about this. We we're using the word China, uh, and we're talking about the government entity that rules that country with an iron fist. We're not talking about the people of China. I'm sure the people of China are great people. I know people from China. They are great people. Our problem is not them. Our problem is this totalitarian, authoritarian bully regime that is really tantamount, General, you correct me if I'm wrong, to kind of an organized crime family at this point what how can we retaliate what should the president do to retaliate well you know we could we should do continue doing a lot of things we have been doing and and and, uh things like tariffs you know tariffs rather than being a temporary measure based on the section 301 investigation they should be made permanent Uh, rather than allowing to you know our retirement funds to go to chinese uh, stocks and bonds uh, we should prevent that. Rather than allowing U.S. corporations to invest in China, we should prevent that. All of those things are available to the federal government. Uh, they can and should be uh, utilized to reshift supply chains, to reshore manufacturing in the United States. And I think when we do, you're going to see a much weaker China and a much stronger uh, United States. When the people of our country uh, have been fed up with uh, certain regimes in history and we've wanted to make change, uh, uh, the people of the United States of America have been able to use the power of our purse, even outside of the federal government. I I take, for example, South Africa, where many uh, public employee unions and private unions and college campuses protested and demanded that uh, businesses divest from South Africa and not invest in that country. Uh, and that made a huge impact. Should should we, the people of this country, start looking at the Chinese government in that same way? Should we demand that our pension funds and our personal investments don't include businesses that originate from China? Because those businesses are part of the Chinese military, are they not? You can't do anything in China without being part of the Chinese military. That's absolutely correct. And you know what happens today is corporations and universities and and uh, investment banks all promote this um, relationship with the Chinese Communist Party, and they're putting a lot of pressure on the administration and Congress to continue to, you know, essentially trade with China to allow them to have access to our capital markets because they're all making money on the basis of this. The universities are getting billions of dollars. Investment banks and corporate America are getting billions of dollars. And this is something that we're going to have to contend with because – uh, each one of them puts enormous pressure on the political system in order to continue to uh, perpetuate this. So it's really up to the American people, just like in a way uh, the American people chose an outside of the beltway uh, president. They're going to have to basically realize that our entire system has been co-opted by the Chinese Communist Party, and they're going to have to put pressure on the entire political system to, to break break free of that. General, can we get to uh, the question of this lab in uh, Wuhan? Uh, by the way, our guest is Brigadier General, retired Robert Spaulding, uh, United States Air Force. His book is Stealth War, How China Took Over While America's Elite Slept. I feel like the media is purposely gaslighting us in this story about the lab and the origination of this virus. The president and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and various other administration officials have said there is ample evidence right now to suggest that this virus originated in this lab. 
And yet at the same time, we are seeing uh, reports from intelligence that have been uh, leaked that say that this is not a man-made virus. And the, the media is pretending as though those are two contradictory statements. No one has said that this was man-made. It can come from the lab and still come from a bat, right? Oh, that's absolutely correct. And if you think about it, you know, most humans aren't spending a lot of time living amongst bats. You know, so the fact that this uh, bat uh, related coronavirus could jump to human is one of the things that Sher Jung Lee, which is a leading researcher on this, on these things, uh, found out and, and wrote a report about. So, you know, you, you are right. This idea that it's, that it's naturally occurring, not man-made, does not mean it, it couldn't have escaped from the lab where it was put after she went to a cave and got it and, and brought it and researched and did research to find out that it was infectious to humans. Right. So they didn't create it in a lab. They were studying this virus. And then through their negligence and the State Department is on record from a couple of years ago, uh, citing this particular lab with having various problems with their safety protocols, that it somehow got out. And that's what we're dealing with here. But but more importantly, listen, mistakes happen, I suppose, though they shouldn't at that level. But general, it's really about the Chinese government's, the communist government's reaction after this happened. That's the real problem, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And I try to explain that the fact that, you know, on the 7th of January, Xi Jinping is in control of Wuhan's crisis, uh, the budding crisis. And so when uh, my understanding of having been there as a defense attache and senior defense official in Beijing, when he took control, I, I negotiated the return of the UUV that was taken in the South China Sea. When, and Xi Jinping was directly in control of that because he was worried about a budding confrontation with the United States. When he's in control, he's in control and has full control and full knowledge of what's going on in the situation. And so 7th of January, he says he's in full control. 13th of January, we know for a fact that they know, China, Chinese Communist Party knows that they have human-to-human transmission. And then they wait until the 23rd of January after 5 million people have left Wuhan to close down Wuhan. And then finally, we also know that the, around this time they become a net importer of PPE, not a net exporter. And so they're basically locking down masks and other protective gear around the world, having bringing it into China. At the same time, they're telling the WHO and the world there's nothing to see here, nothing to worry about. And then, of course, 23 January, they lock down Wuhan. 30 January, the WHO uh, claims we have a global pandemic, and that's after you know, they were hiding uh, or they were basically hoarding PPE and then also allowing these five million people to leave Wuhan. General, my uh, daughter, who's just finishing her plebe year at the uh, Naval Academy, uh, got so charged up to see the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds with their uh, uh, scheduled flyovers at various parts of the country. Uh, but I got to think, even as a retired uh, Brigadier General, you also get charged up when you see that. Did you get a chance to see the flyover from the Thunderbirds with the Blue Angels? I didn't get to personally see it. You know, I could hear them uh, from my house in uh, in Northern Virginia. But, um, yeah, I mean, I thought it was cool to see the picture of I have never seen the Blue Angels and, and the Thunderbirds do a flyover together. So I thought, yeah. I really thought that was neat. It was great. I got to see them bank. I'm in uh, North Bethesda, so I got to see them bank right around the Beltway there from uh, from the Potomac up over to Silver Spring and then back to the mall. It was a sight to behold. And uh, I think that they're scheduled for Southern California uh, sometime soon. We'll get those dates for you in a moment. But uh, yeah, no, no matter where you are in the military or for that matter, as a civilian, there's nothing like it. Uh, General, thanks for joining us, sir. Thank you so much. It is the Larry O'Connor Show on KABC. Yes, I am in the nation's capital. Larry O'Connor show here for you, Southern California, every day from 10 till noon. And we do talk about everything through your perspective, through our perspective as Southern Californians. Uh, that that end of that interview there got uh, very D.C. centric, though, with a general, sadly, as we were uh, sort of probably making you jealous with the fact that we had the uh, Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds do a flyover this past weekend in Washington, D.C. Uh, here's the deal. It was the last flyover of both the Blue Angels and Thunderbirds together as a tandem. Uh, however, fret not. Southern California will get a flyover. Uh, it will be the Thunderbirds only. What they're doing now is there are various flyovers that are scheduled right now with various uh, aircraft, uh, even beyond the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels, for various cities. Right now, the schedules only take us through May 12th, which will be a... Uh, 
in New York, a KC-135 Stratotanker and an F-35 Lightning II. That's pretty cool. Uh, those will be flying over. And Miami, Jacksonville will get the Blue Angels May 8th. Uh, here's the deal. They're splitting the East Coast and the West Coast. So the Blue Angels are going to handle east of the Mississippi with these uh, flyovers over the course of the next couple of weeks. And the Thunderbirds will handle the flyovers west of the Mississippi. So fret not, Southern California. You will get your Thunderbird flyover. And as soon as we have the details on it, we'll let you know. In fact, we should even get one of those Thunderbird uh, airmen here uh, talking to us. We have friends. We know airmen. We know people in the Air Force. We'll get them, and we'll talk about it. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, dovetailing off of our conversation about China and the supreme culpable actions that is just undeniable at this point, Nancy Pelosi of California, your Speaker of the House, continues continues the Democrats' blind spot with China. What is their problem with China? Why are they so supportive of China? Well, uh, she says so right in this the sound clip you're about to hear, she explains it all. If you're wondering why you have people in the media and you have Democrats at the highest levels of their party, you don't get higher than the Speaker of the House, who are making excuses for the Communist Party of China, and you're wondering why they're doing that, she explains it all right here. It's pretty much why they've done everything that they've done for the last four years, because of the bad orange man in the White House. And a reference to what you're saying about China, yes, we want to know how this started. But we want to know what the president knew and when he knew it and what his administration did or didn't do about it. We're really more interested in what President Trump knew about this virus than we are about what China knew about the virus. Because, you know, Trump is a much bigger existential threat than the Chinese Communist Party with a track record of murdering tens of millions over the course of the last hundred years, eh, 70 years to be exact. They, they really they really can't be trusted to govern when they are this blinded by their hatred. And make no mistake, they had nothing to run on this November. Nothing. Their, their, their last shot in the dark was impeachment. And it fizzled. It blew up in their face. And now, I'm telling you, every single ad you see from Democrats and the candidates and the political action groups that support them from this point until election day it's all going to be about the coronavirus listen to that here here's one right here this is a this is a thing called the lincoln project these are disaffected trump hating republicans they still call themselves republicans i think i'm not sure right now president trump enjoy something like 97 percent approval amongst republicans some things i've never seen in my lifetime even in ronald reagan's presidency he didn't enjoy that kind of support from republicans but these guys call themselves republicans they've always hated trump and they've put out an ad because they've endorsed joe biden because that's just how good a republican they are they endorse joe biden and listen to their ad at how offensive it is to the memory of ronald reagan there's mourning in america Today, more than 60,000 Americans have died from a deadly virus Donald Trump ignored. With the economy in shambles, more than 26 million Americans are out of work. The worst economy in decades. Trump bailed out Wall Street, but not Main Street. This afternoon, millions of Americans will apply for unemployment. And with their savings run out, many are giving up hope. Millions worry that a loved one won't survive COVID-19. There's mourning in America. And under the leadership of Donald Trump, our country is weaker and sicker and poorer. And now, Americans are asking, if we have another four years like this, will there even be an America? I, I mean, uh... the suggestion, first of all, that Trump is responsible for the COVID-19 deaths is offensive on its face to then suggest that the unemployment and the hardships that have been brought on by our response to this virus and to the pandemic is in some way in uh, a forward-looking indication of what the next four years will be is moronic and indefensibly ignorant when you know and everyone knows so well what our economy was like what our country was like for the first three years and two months of the Trump administration until the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's crap like this 
that actually feeds the conspiracy theories. When people think this whole thing was made up, there really wasn't a virus. They just came up with this because it was the latest thing they could do with the latest hoax that they could perpetrate against the president. And that's BS. It's, it's, it's ridiculous conspiracy theory. Alex Jones put on your aluminum foil hat kind of crap. But when despicable political operators actually put on an ad like that, it feeds into it because we know better. We're way more intelligent than these obnoxious, despicable leftists think we are. And we can see right through it, but the fact that they're using this as the political weapon that they are makes reasonable people think, oh my God, they they came up with this whole thing because it's the only thing they've got to hit Trump with. Beware, beware of what's out there and don't fall for it. Keep your head about you. That's why you're here, right here on this program, The Larry O'Connor Show, KBC.